Welcome to another episode of Concussed, Understanding the Invisible Injury. This is a special show. We are worldwide, as you know, and we'll be going over to Asia, exactly Hong Kong, talking to one of the one of my favorites, watching him play, of course, Barry Beck. We'll talk to him about a little bit about his career, obviously after career. Now he's over in Hong Kong. And of course, what's really important is he's done an incredible job, obviously working with his uh, new cause called Fallen Stars Mental Health Services. We'll find all about that. Just before we bring Barry up, where were you in 72? Do not forget. We'll ask Barry about it. Obviously, Paul Henderson scored a very famous goal, 34 minute, uh, seconds left uh, in Russia to secure the Summit Series. And we'll ask Barry, where was he, I bet you, was in either on the ice somewhere or he was in front of the TV uh, watching this incredible feat, just like I was. He probably, he's 64, I'm 62. He was probably in grade eight and probably was watching black and white television. We'll, uh, we'll get a little bit of fun asking him that. Now, listen, don't forget, every Tuesday we've got Concussed Understanding the Invisible Injury, where we talk about the injury itself, obviously with doctors and with people that have suffered them. And of course, what are the effects of concussions? And one of them, obviously, is mental health. And that's why we've got a great opportunity to talk to uh, Barry Beck about that. Hey, listen, without further ado, drafted by the Colo. Rado Rockies. How many people put their hands up? How many people remember that team? I do. First round, second overall uh, in 1977. Barry Beck. Thank you. Nice to be on the show. Hey, Barry, great to have you. I know it's very early. You're in Hong Kong, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes, I am. Uh, what, it'd be about seven o'clock in the morning? Uh, yes, which is actually not too early for older guys like us there's well, a I know. time zone time I know. zone changes <laughs> yeah true hey listen let's uh obviously we thank you very much uh for joining us so early in the morning we're honored that uh you would do this today i know you're very close to the the Roche family uh jordan and john are just absolutely been fantastic jordan of course is uh the producer of the show we're blessed to have him uh and also it's been brought to you by the fired up network. So we're really excited to get into talking about your career, Barry. Obviously, uh, you're a BC boy. I uh, had the opportunity to come through the BC JHL. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet some kids just recently who played in it. It's a, a fantastic uh, league and it was in, it's called Langley Lords. Talk to us a little bit about back in the 70s, early 70s, how hockey was evolving. Well, I think at that time, uh, we sort of scaled our team or tried to we're, we're getting in the mold of the Philadelphia Flyers in the, in the BC junior hockey league at that time. And so it was uh, starting to become uh, this intimidating force, which every team saw success in. And Langley was actually the farm team of the Vancouver Nats that were in the Western Canada hockey league. Uh, the same as the newest Mr. Bruins. And my brother um, had played for the Vancouver Nats and they had let him go. And then the newest Mr. Bruins, newest Minster is only about 15, 20 minutes away from Vancouver. And uh, newest Minster picked him up. So my brother played at newest Minster and I would go, and a lot of us players from Langley would go as it's all, uh, it is also newest Minster sort of in the middle of, of Vancouver and Langley. So we from Langley would go and watch the Bruins game at Queens Park Arena. And um, I mean, we thought that was the best hockey you could ever play. So it was great to watch those players all come through Langley McDonald and all the big guns, uh, Tom Isaac on a medicine hat. I mean, you could go on and on. Uh, but as soon as I saw them play and their style, which was even another level from the BC Junior Hockey League, uh, sort of a la flyer style, uh, an intimidating style of hockey, but also with talent. Um, I saw how that could be successful, and I wanted to be on that team. Uh, just had to work out a deal on how to get there. And that deal was made by me writing a letter to Ed Chenelf at the time, or my parents, saying that they wanted me to be closer to home uh, for my schooling. And newest Minster was close to Vancouver. So through that letter, which sort of Ernie had told my mom and dad to, to write, Ernie McClain, the coach yeah. of uh, New West, 
Oh, and uh, so then there was the deal made between, which was then Vancouver had already changed to become Kamloops Chiefs and uh, over that year. And so the deal was made between Kamloops and New Westminster. And then I became a New Westminster Bruin and played with a lot of players that I had been playing ag against the year before who were in Bellingham. And that was New Westminster's farm team players such as Brad Maxwell, Kevin Shamhorn, Stan Smeal, Miles Zaharko, um, Bruce Andres, a lot of a lot of players that uh, would go on and and uh, be pillars uh, for the New Westminster Bruins for three years. Well, back in uh, 74, uh, 75, the team was just an absolute stud of a team. You mentioned Ernie McLean. A lot of people may remember it as Punch McLean. I had the opportunity to obviously play one game against you. It was an exhibition game. And I, intimidation, I was scared poopless. So I got to be honest, it worked. Uh, but you had guys like Mark uh, Loftos, an incredible player, 70 games, 112 points. Another one that I had the opportunity to bring over to Australia for our ice hockey classic was John O'Grodnick. He was an absolute legend and was fantastic over there. So as you came through the uh, Western Hockey League, of course, uh, and getting the opportunity to be drafted uh, by the Colorado Rockies, walk us through the you know the transition. Obviously, it was rough and tough and rugged. We know the Broad Street Bully days, and that's when you came up and you were a big boy and you 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 played it. You played larger than even your size. Talk to us about that effect of going from, you know, obviously junior and then stepping up in those days in a league that was not only intimidating, but it was tough. Yeah, well, just quickly getting back to Mark Lofthouse and Johnny O, they, I mean, there are some players that I will most likely forget, and we can go on and we'll talk about that later on forgetting players that you played with. And, yeah. and, um, and they, of course, so were great players for the Bruins. But making the transition, um, you know, I automatically went to a different team. And I was called by Montreal, and if I would accept going to them in the, uh, before the draft happened. And uh, I told them, no, I didn't want to go to Montreal because I wanted to play. And I thought I, and by going to Colorado that I would have a better chance of just stepping in and playing right away and getting a lot of ice time. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what happened. Um, and we did have a few tough players, but we weren't on the scale as even, uh, uh, I was with the Bruins or on any scale like Philadelphia. So it would take a while for us to become competitive. And I didn't mind that. I, I liked it. I was playing a lot. My second year, I got a knee injury and had a, have a scope done on it. So I missed a few games, but. Uh, first year we made the playoffs and we played Philadelphia in the first round and it was a shortened series back then they had those three out of three out of five series and um, anyways it was a uh, overtime game the first game in Philadelphia where I think they won two one and then they beat us three one back in Colorado so so we played them pretty tough and I thought from there that we could carry that momentum on to the next year. Next year, I think we drafted Mike Gillis and the year after that, Rob Ramage. So we were building the team there. And then there was, then there was talk of us moving to New Jersey. And when we used to go from Colorado and we would go into Manhattan to play the Rangers, I, I used to hate it because we would have to always follow the older guys and what bars they wanted to go to after <laughs> the games. Yeah, and uh, they weren't the same same bars that the young guys were going to. <laughs> they were they were different kind of bars, and that were es established. And so you had to go there. So I didn't get much of a, a view of Manhattan at that time, and we knew that New Jersey was just across, uh, just across the river, <clears throat> and uh, it was sort of a bog, uh, New Jersey. So it was like a swamp. So that wasn't too attractive at the time. So I got into this uh, sort of a, not a bidding war, but I wanted to redo my contract and renegotiate it. <clears throat> I had signed a five-year deal, and I think it was for 85000 a year, and there was a couple of guys playing on our team that were making 
225,000 and I had a really great year my first year. And it actually, I don't want to say that it sounded easy, but it was, it was uh, a good time for me to step into the league. Uh, I'd sort of already got a reputation out of junior. And so, although you're going to have to prove yourself again, at least I got a little bit of room uh, to move because every league you go up, it's a step faster, players are a step stronger, and uh, you got to bring yourself up to that level quickly. Um, so I managed to do that, actually, each step in my hockey career. I was able to go up to that next level and meet that next level and even rise to the top of it. So, and I think I really, uh, I've got to give credit to just being the surroundings that I grew up in in East Vancouver. Um, it was tough and it was athletic. So if you played sports, you had to be tough when you played. You played on the school grounds and, and so on. You had to have that yep. mentality. Barry, we're having a we're having a little tech, technical issue right now with your microphone. Uh, obviously, being over in Hong Kong at this moment, moment, I guess the Wi-Fi is not working and sending the signal over. Uh, we apologize for everybody that's listening. Obviously, we're here tonight on Connected Understanding the Invisible Injury, brought to you by the good people at Fired Up Network. Barry Beck, six hundred and fifteen games in the National Hockey League. Uh, let's check your mic again, Barry. Okay, working. Yeah, we're still having an issue. Why don't you go in and out, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we haven't yet talked about as far as your career go. Uh, I know that Jordan will take care of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Barry Beck will be right back. We're just going to try and make sure he refreshes and we get him back on because his stories are second to none. Uh, listen, as we're waiting for Barry to get back into this, uh, in 19, listen to these numbers. These are absolutely amazing numbers. In 1975-76, for the new Winst Winster, Winster, uh, Westminster Bruins, 68 games, 19 goals, 80 assists for 99 points as a defenseman. But more importantly, 325 minutes in penalty. He certainly uh, showed that he was one of the guys that were going to advance to the National Hockey League, not only with all over a point a game in the Western Hockey League, but uh, very tough. Uh, with 325 uh, penalty minutes. When you get 99 points, just one below 100, I know you guys can figure that out. That is incredible as a defenseman, especially in that league at that time. Then, listen to these numbers. 1980, 81 for the New York Rangers. 75 games, 11 goals, 23 assists. Those are fantastic numbers for 34 points. 231 minutes and penalties. Wow, those are numbers. Uh, when he broke into the National Hockey League uh, with the Colorado Rockies, 1977-78, as a youngster, 75 games, 22 goals as a rookie, 38 points, or 38 assists, 60 points, and still showed his toughness with 89 points, uh, 89 penalty minutes. That is a remarkable, and we've got Barry back. We're really excited. I know. Hi, Barry. Morning. Good morning. Uh, now now we get my, to see that beautiful thing. My my tech savvy is a little bit short this morning. Uh, let's just blame uh, <clears throat> let's blame the waves over the ocean. I was just saying, Barry, as we were talking, you were walking us through your career. Uh, I, I I do want to make a comment. You had ninety nine points in nineteen seventy five seventy six as a defenseman in sixty eight games. That itself is remarkable. Uh, but you had 325 minutes. Where'd you find the time to be out of the penalty box to get all those points? Well, it, was, it was funny because Brad Maxwell and I, and Brad, Brad was a great Westminster Bruin and went on to play in Minnesota. And I sort of wish that we had become partners in the NHL also. Um, but he had 99 points also. So going into the last game, uh, Ernie McLean moved the game to uh, the Van Vancouver Pacific Coliseum to attract more fans. And uh, so we had a big crowd and we were playing Medicine Hat. And of course, Maxie and I both had 99 points and we were sort of had a little side bet on who would get to 100 points. Anyways, we got into a, a brawl in the first period and we were both thrown out of the game. So none of us got to 100 points. We sort of were trying to get that 
that credit for at least getting 100 points. But at that particular season, you know, we were we were a team. And so that was our better year. It was our second year, I think, possibly anyways. Yeah. Well, obviously, then you went, obviously, we said in Colorado, I mentioned that 75 games, 60 points as a rookie, incredible, 89 uh, penalty minutes. And then you moved on to the Rangers. And this will be the last part we talk about the hockey because I really want to get into your great, uh, what you're doing now. It's so important. Uh, but I do have to mention it. I'll mention it again. 75 games, 11 goals, 23 assists, 34 points, and 231 penalty minutes as a defenseman. You certainly made your mark and you had uh, a point a game in the playoffs that year. Those are big numbers. Talk to us about then and now. Obviously, being a big, rugged defenseman in your day, uh, certainly there weren't a lot of guys your size in it. Uh, so talk to us about what you see t- from your days to now. Everybody's six foot four, 240 pounds playing in the National Hockey League. And you were one of those guys at six foot three, 215. Now you're just an average size defenseman. Shows. Yeah, you're. I'm sorry, you're cutting in and out here. Yeah, sorry about that, Barry. I, I know we're having a little bit of a bad luck with the reception. I was just going to say, if you can hear me correctly, what um, obviously you being six foot three, two hundred and fifteen pounds at the time. Now all defensemen are over six foot four, most of them, and they're you know weighing in at two twenty five, two forty. Tell us the difference what you see then and now, because you were a very large defenseman in those days and now you know you'd fit probably in the average yeah i think the pace of the game i mean there, there was obviously fast skaters in the years that i played but it's uh, it's the puck movement uh the skill of the players i mean at practice now they have a skills coach for pretty well everything and even before the nhl uh, you have that in major junior university hockey. So they're really concentrating on skills. And uh, and you can see that when you watch the game. Big defensemen. I mean, forwards are big. So, but there's there's still room for the small man to be able to play in the game. And, uh, you know, that, of course, comes from heart. And, uh, and if you ever see smaller guys that play in the NHL, they usually got tree trunk quads on them. And, huge legs because they're developing those legs on the squat rack and yeah. and uh, really getting a lot of power in the lower half of their body. But, yeah, it has become a bigger man's game. And, I mean, six foot three, sort of, sort of an average player right now. As you go up the charts and they get up to six foot eight and you get into that territory, you wonder, you're sort of amazed at, at the uh, – the the skill level and the athleticism that they have. Well, obviously, uh, you know, uh, Herb Brooks played a big role and was very highly talked about. We've got a question from Barry Shelley for you, uh, Barry, before we get on to talking about your fallen stars. Um, what impact did he have on your career while you were with the Rangers? You know, to me, Herb was probably the best coach technically uh, for the game. He made the game fun because everybody was in on the attack. It wasn't just four players and one defenseman stay back. It was all five players. And he was always upset if you dumped the puck in. So that was when sort of regrouping all started to happen. That was when the forwards, if they had no play at, when they got over center, then they would move it back to their defenseman and then rotate through the zones and you would get good flow going. And then the DD can move up and attack also on the attack. So you had five players attacking. So it was an exciting time. I really loved Herb. Um, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of pressure for him to win. Obviously he was a winner wherever he went in Minnesota. And of course with the 1980 miracle on ice team, and then when we, we came we came to us, that was when, of course, the Islanders had their great runs through the four years for in the early 80s. And uh, we were just getting up and starting to match them. But 
it's pretty tough to compete with them. I, I don't know how many Hall of Famers they have, but yeah. if you look at a team and they got seven or eight Hall of Famers during the same years, you know that they won, you know, three or four cups or they were pretty good. So we weren't at that quite level, but uh, with her style of play, uh, it sort of proved to me what a good coach L. Arbor was because right. he was able to sort of match that defensively, but it was it was uh, an attack and a puck possession style of play with a lot of skill. And uh, our team went from being a bigger team in 1981, where we were one of the bigger teams in the league, to becoming a little bit smaller but faster and a, uh, a different style of play. Now, some people can say, well, that was successful or or not as successful, but I thought that we had better teams that when it was more fun to play as a player. When you're yeah. when you're a defenseman and you're able to attack, then that's a lot of fun. Yeah, no question. And you talked about the New York Islanders in those days. They did have seven or eight Hall of Famers, but then they had a bunch of role players. I remember Butch Goring with the Fabs helmet and you know players like that that just that lit up in the playoffs. Listen, uh, Barry, uh, I just want to ask you before we move on to obviously something that's playing on everybody's minds. Uh, this is concussed, understanding the invisible injury from this injury. We know it could play a role on mental health. In 1972, we have to say it, today is the 49th anniversary of Paul Henderson scoring that famous goal. Uh, I know we've just lost uh, our friend uh Barry Beck, he will be back on. I will be asking you about the 49th year since Paul Henderson scored that famous goal that we all talked about. I know I was in grade six. I certainly think uh, Barry would have been in grade eight uh, at the time. He's two years older than myself. And I know that would have been uh, probably a, a legendary moment for him as it was for all of us back in 1972. I know we've got Barry back. Uh, Barry, uh, we're just waiting for Barry to hopefully get his mic back on. Uh, it's always a challenge, guys. We really appreciate it early in the morning. And uh, Barry's got himself uh, muted, so we're just hoping that he will unmute himself, which I know he will. Um, it's been a situation where, uh, you know, today with technology, when you're doing these type of shows all around the world, you end up with these uh, difficulties at times. And, of course, we're dealing with that right at this moment. Uh, we are going to, before we let Barry go, we're going to talk about something that's very important to him. He's been over in Asia for well over 10 years. Uh, he's been a master of helping uh, China uh, develop their their uh, minor leagues over there, which is so important. Uh, and now he has taken on a new project, which is ultimately one of the most important. After a career playing like Barry did, a rough, tough guy, I'm sure he suffered his concussions. We will talk to him about that in a few seconds. Uh, when you suffer from concussions, we know mental health can play a role. And he has started up an organization called the Fallen Stars Mental Health Services. Uh, as I mentioned, he is in Hong Kong uh, where he is residing and he's been there for the last 10 years knowing Jordan and of course uh, his father, uh, John. Well, we're just waiting for Barry to get uh, the technical issues uh, out of the way. Uh, as we do this, I wanna read about uh, obviously uh, Barry's mission. Uh, it is to empower our community and future generations to respect mental health through different outlets, all rooted in love, compassion, and without prejudice or judgment. So important words, very uh, stoic when you think about it. One of the things that we need to understand, especially while we go through these difficult times uh, with COVID and the isolation that comes along with it, we all, whether you're young or old, we must remember the future generations will struggle if we do not respect mental health issues, uh, and of course, uh, with love, as you mentioned, compassion without prejudice and judgment. And I know we've had several people on the show that have, I know Jordan's going to pop up here for a second because we've been dealing with some technical issues. Hey, Jordan, how are you, buddy? We got technical issues all over the place. <laughs> I, I'm muted myself. So uh, it's too bad we could, uh, we're having some issues with Barry's, uh, with Barry's side, mm -hmm. but 
you know what we're going to do is that we're going to we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, you're going to text Barry and say, "Listen, we apologize for all these technical issues. Uh, this is a great interview. Uh, I think what we should do is revisit this. We'll tape it. Let's tape it because I think his yeah. messaging is so important, and it's got to be so frustrating on him. So you and your father, you guys can figure out a time where we can actually tape it, and it will be a special edition. We got a few minutes with him. Uh, the famous, legendary uh, Barry Beck. You know him. Your father knows him. Talk to us a little bit about the impact he's had over in China. I mean, it, it's huge. I mean, you get to see it every day because, uh, you know, he, he's, he lives at the rink, essentially, and he has just popped in as well. But, you know, just, just, just talking about Barry, I mean, he's, he, he's always really nice to the rink. I played I, – I had some good uh, memories with his son playing as well. Um, just a really nice guy. Uh, obviously, uh, I'll let Barry talk about that a little more. But um, yeah, I'm. I, I, I was really honored to have him around the rink. I didn't know too much about his playing days then, but I've kind of over the years educated myself a little bit on, on what kind of Barry means to the hockey world. Well, and of course, education, education is key, as Jeff Lieberman uh, has brought up, and that's why it's so important. Uh, players like. Uh, icon, I would almost call legendary Barry Beck. Uh, we need him to speak up and which he's doing, which is so important because sometimes big rugged guys, uh, we kind of, well, I'm not putting myself in his league. Uh, we didn't talk about it a lot. Now we have the ability. And when we hear Barry Beck talk about it, we open up. Let's see if we can get Barry on, but we will uh, revisit this. Barry, how are you, buddy? Listen, uh, I think, uh, Barry, if you can hear me, don't worry, Barry. What we're going to do, Barry, is uh, we are going to bring you back. What we're going to do is you, I, and Jordan with John, we're going to figure out a time where we can get you and we'll record it. We'll pre-record it because you, your messaging is so important. You, as the person that you are, uh, have developed a great relationship. I talked about, obviously, the Fallen Stars, uh, your mental health uh, service. Obviously, we talked about your mission, which I find absolutely incredible. So, Barry, uh, I know that uh, Jordan and his father will connect with you. And we'll end this uh, by you're going to coordinate that. There's Barry there for a few seconds. He's got a pretty face. Can you text him? Do you have the ability to text him? I do. I do. Okay. Text him right now. Just tell him I don't want him to be stressed out. We need him to come back and talk because there's so much more about Barry. Yeah. Ben. We've got enough about his hockey career. When we get him, we won't talk about his hockey career. We'll delve right into the Fallen Stars Mental Health Services. And, of course, you mentioned his son. So I think we should touch upon that at a better time so that he doesn't have to pop in and out uh, we, because we need to listen to his message. So if you don't mind uh, dealing with that. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Right. Okay. Yeah. Hey, listen, you've been watching Concussed, Understanding the Vigil Invisible Injury, of course, brought to you by Fired Up Network and, of course, Gooch Live Productions. Uh, we have Barry Beck uh, in the wings. I know that we've had some technical issues. Uh, we got a great opportunity to talk to him about his career. That was exciting. Uh, but I really, really want the opportunity to talk to Barry about his great initiative, as I mentioned, Fallen Stars. Uh, the mission is simple. It is to empower our communities and the future generations to respect mental health. I love this statement. And I'm going to ask him when we get him back on, is it his? Because it's uh, uh, stoic in the sense that respect mental health through different outlets, all rooted in love, compassion, and without prejudice or judgment. And that's exactly what we are doing here uh, with Connected Mental Health. And we are excited to join forces with Fallen Stars and Barry Beck. Hey, listen, I know that Jordan is organizing it already. I can see the wheels turning. He's going to take care of it. We will have Barry Beck on once again. We'll do a special uh, report just with Barry Beck. I wanted to show you uh, what a great looking logo they put together. Uh, he'll explain what that is. This is the Fallen Stars, Barry Beck all the way in uh, Hong Kong. All right, I want to thank you so much for watching and listening. I know it didn't turn out exactly the way we wanted, but that's what Wi-Fi is all about, and that's what uh, 2021 is all about. You have to pivot, and that's what we've done. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining